Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 17 there. And as you're turning to that passage, I uh, want you to entertain a couple of thoughts. The one is that I must heed warning signs. The other thing I want you to keep in the back of your head is that the events of this book are not necessarily recorded in chronological order as we might write a history. They were instead recorded in thematic order. So it's believed by, the mo by most Bible scholars that the events that we discussed last week happened significantly later than what happened today. It's not necessarily important, but it's just good information to have. Regardless of what order things happened in, the event that we're going to look at today was a very pivotal thing in David's reign. And we see that his behavior ushers in many problems for himself and his nation through this one act. And we're going to continue to see the results of some of this in the next few weeks. But I trust that you found the passage by now. It is 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. And as is our custom, if you would please rise in reverence to the reading of the word of the Lord. 2 Samuel 11, 1. In the spring, when kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled abound on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. A very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he said, Isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterward, she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. David sent orders to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing and how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all his master's servants. He did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home, David questioned Uriah, haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered David, the ark Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live and by your life, I will not do this. Stay here today also, David said to Uriah, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him. And David got him drunk. He went out in the evening to lie down on his cot with his master servants, but he did not go home. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In the letter he wrote, put Uriah at the front of the fiercest fighting, then withdraw from him so that he is struck down and dies. When Joab was besieging the city, he put Uriah in the place where he knew the best enemy soldiers were. Then the men of the city came out and attacked Joab, and some of the men from David's soldiers fell in the battle. Uriah the Hittite also died. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Lord, we thank you for recording 
this event in history for us to look at and to learn from today. And we ask that our hearts and minds would be transformed by the hearing of your word today. And we ask this in the name of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Have you all ever stopped to really pay attention to how many signs there are driving up the road? There are dozens and dozens of signs, depending on where you drive, warning you about things like speed limits or where you should stop or, uh, you know, if there are dangerous situations ahead. Lots and lots of signs warning you about these things. Now, have you ever stopped to consider how dangerous it is to ignore these signs? I remember a time back, I was just out of high school. I was working night shift at a nursing home, and there, was, there were two of us on that shift. It was an overnight shift. And the nurse that was working with me had two teenage daughters who were out driving in, you know, rural Kansas is much like rural Virginia in the fact that you can't see a whole lot at night. Well, they were driving down a back road and somebody in another vehicle blew right through a stop sign and of course did not have his headlights on either for some reason it was and we're talking like one or two in the morning blew through t-boned their car seriously injured these two girls how might that situation have been different if this person had paid attention to the situation and used his lights and observed the speed limit and stopped at the stop sign. Could have been a, a whole lot different. The accident could not have happened. So we have warnings and they're there to prevent us from making serious errors. Now, we see all kinds of warnings and stop signs, if you will, in this passage today. And we're going to look at those. We're going to, we're going to take a look at, you know, these stop signs that David willingly blew through. But I think first we should take note of the fact that David, by this point in his life, was actually a habitual offender. He was already guilty of doing things that God did not want him to be doing. And we can observe this, and we should observe this, because past behaviors, a lot of times, are indications of your future actions. Now, not always. You know, we, learned, we did learn in Sunday school about the Apostle Paul. <laughs> His past behaviors were obviously not always indicative. But in this case, David's work. David, in his past, had already exhibited a blatant disregard for God's plan for marriage. He had ignored it completely. And if you, if you were to read back in Deuteronomy 17, 17, you don't have to flip there, um, but God is discussing then a plan for a king for Israel, and he specifically commands, he must not acquire many wives for himself, so that his heart won't go astray. Now, back in 2 Samuel chapter 3, the, the uh, chronicler mentions that David has six sons by six different wives. And by the way, none of those were his first wife, Michal, the, the daughter of King Saul, because she never had children. Also, none of those, you know, because the time wasn't yet, none of those were his son Solomon, who Bathsheba would give birth to. So he has taken on a lot of wives, not only in violation of God's original 
plan in creating marriage, but in violation of specific direction for what kings should do, because the practice of kings in those days was to just take on lots and lots of wives from various parts of the world to form alliances. You know, they were taken on uh, politically. It wasn't a matter of, you know, they. I, I love her. It's a matter of, I want to not be at war with this person. So if I have, if I have this king's daughter as one of my wives, he won't attack me. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, he had better in-laws than some of us, but we'll move on from there. <clears throat> David does this, you know, even though we can look at this and go, all these different wives, and, oh, that's a lot. That is really a small-scale thing compared to what his son, the next generation, Solomon, what he will do with his 700 wives and 300 concubines, or as a small child once pronounced it, porcupines. <laughs> but David's ignoring of God's plan for marriage in his past made it easy for him to continue to do so. This habit had become his pattern. His pattern was taking on new women whenever he just wanted to. It was okay. He was the king. He could do what he wants. Who's going to tell him no? The thing is, in engaging in this sin, David, if he were paying attention, would have found out something that should be obvious to us all, which is that Sin is never satisfied. It is never done with you. And if you get away with it once, you're going to think you can get away with it again. And you're going to still want to do the same things. You know, I'll, get, I'll, I'll use the example of drinking, and I'm not saying that, you know... I'm, I'm not going to go into a dissertation on this, but, you know, if you are prone to drinking, when you drink, guess what you're going to want again later? It's not like, okay, there's this one beer and I'm done forever. <laughs> Any, is, anybody found that's how it works? If you have, you've received a miracle and good on you, but... You find that, you know, it's not satisfying permanently. And David's sin was the same way. It was never satisfied. He was always looking toward the next wife. And so when the opportunity to sin presented itself, David was already by his nature, by his behavior, in the habit of giving in to that sin. And, of course, he had opportunity to do that because he was being neglectful of his duties. You know, we saw very clearly in the beginning, you know, when the kings go out to war, well, he didn't. He sent his people out to war and he stayed in the palace. That wasn't really where he should have been. That wasn't where his duty lied. And by being at home when all of his fighting men were away, that gave him an opportunity to pursue this sin because he was being neglectful in one area. It created an opportunity for something else, and that's so often the case. If we find ourselves in a place where we are not supposed to be, the chance of sinning there is much greater. That's just the way it is. When you're outside of where God wants you, 
the opportunity will present itself. David was lying about his palace, relaxing in luxury while his men were at war. This time away from where he was, was all the opportunity needed. It didn't take much. He created the habit. He created the opportunity. And now, you know, we're going to look at this because it's important. He ignored every stop sign along the way. And I say this to warn you to think ahead of time. God will always provide an opportunity for you to stop going the direction you're going and turn away from sin and turn back to him. And he provided lots of stop signs in this. Now, the first thing we see, you know, David got up, you know, and the way it's kind of presented in commentaries and stuff is, you know, because it's very hot in the afternoons in the desert, these people sleep in the afternoons, get up in the evening to go about doing their thing. So he got up, you know, walking around on the roof of the palace, which is, you know, the, the place to be at certain times of day because the wind blows and, you know, they didn't have air conditioning like we do. So he's walking around on top of the palace and he sees a woman bathing. Now, let's not think Bathsheba to be immodest here, and I'm not going to dive deeply into the uh, controversy among scholars over whether she was actually sinning or not. You know, there, there are scholars willing to die on both sides of that hill, and I say, I'll leave that answer to God. But she was bathing in the courtyard of her house, which is the normal place that people bathed. It was, you know, surrounded by walls, but not a ceiling. Her neighbors couldn't see her. But David, you know, being up on his roof on the, you know, on the highest part of the city, could see down into her courtyard. And there she was bathing. It's probably just starting to get dark. You know, she probably had no clue somebody would be watching from up above. But think about this, and particularly, you know, men, because men tend to be more visually oriented than women. He saw her you know, naked, taking a bath, beautiful woman taking a bath, you know, it's like, oops, there she is. That first view was not the sin. That first view was his opportunity to turn his eyes to something else. His sin was when he said, ooh, let me look again. That's where it started. You know, and for those of you who may use computers that, you know, and you know that pornography is everywhere now, that pop-up that you close down right away is not the sin. The sin is if you follow that link. If you let yourself be lured into that. His first sighting of her was not intentional. It wasn't sinful. But when he took that second look, then he was drawn into the web of sin. Because you lust first with your eyes. And he did. He looked, then he looked again. Had he not looked again, no sin would have occurred. So that was the first stop sign he blew through. The second stop sign that he blew through was when he asked someone about her. He was then drawing his people into his sin. 
It's like, well, I gotta know who that girl is. Whenever you get to the point of drawing somebody into your sin, you make yourself more guilty for one, but you also make them guilty as well. We should not be so anxious to share our guilt with others. And the fact that he was so comfortable doing this should have been a warning to him. The fact that he had to ask, hey, who is this girl? Can I, can I get her brought up here? That should have caused him to pause, but it didn't. Now, the third stop sign really should have really been a warning to him. When they told him who she was, you know, those names may not mean anything to us. You know, her father Eliab, well, her father Eliab was a friend of David's, one of his trusted warriors, we're told elsewhere in the Bible. This is a guy who works for you's daughter. You know, the daughter of one of your mighty warriors, one of your special forces type troops. She's also the wife of another one of your special forces type troops. And by the way, her grandfather, the father of Eliab, was one of David's closest advisors. He should have realized at that point, this is very off limits. Now, later, her father and grandfather will uh, become his enemies. Think it could have something to do with this? I wouldn't be happy. The fourth stop sign is kind of something to, you know, it's put in here for the reader more than anything. But it's something that he should have been paying attention to. Um, there's a note in here that, and yeah, no children in here that she was purifying herself from her uncleanness. You know, there was a ceremonial washing that every woman had to do about every 28 days or so, if you know what I'm saying. And this was considered to be a most fertile time for a woman. And there's a couple of things at play here. The reason it's included is because it made it very likely that she would, in fact, get pregnant. It also made it very obvious to the reader that the baby that she was carrying did not belong to her husband, who was off at war. You know, there can be no argument from Scripture that this baby didn't belong to David. You know, that Uriah had been home. And Scripture makes that very plain. But David failed all these stop signs, these four different things. He failed to heed the warning, stop and turn around and go back and do what he should have done. And when he failed to heed the stop signs for the initial sin, it led to an even bigger sin. It led to more things going on. Because... Yeah, she wound up pregnant. Big shocker. Y'all have read this story before, right? You know how this happened. So then she tells him, at this point, David could have repented. There's a big problem here, and the big problem is by the law, both of them could have been put to death for adultery. So this is a big problem for both of them. But now, is anybody going to 
stoned the king? Doubtful. But he could have repented. He could have confessed. But instead, he goes into his next part of the plan. Let's bring her husband home. We'll bring her husband home. We'll get him to sleep with her. Everything will be fine. The only problem with that was her husband was a man of integrity. Again, one of David's most trusted warriors. You note in verse 11 what Uriah says. The ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live your life and by your life, I will not do this. David should have heard those words and been called to repentance. He should have felt such conviction. This should have been a neon light saying, stop, don't go any further with this. Confess your sin and be forgiven and move on. But he didn't. He continues with his plan. Now, scholars are, uh, you know, divided a little bit over a very minor issue. And I don't think it really matters, but it's an interesting point. We do know that Uriah had integrity as a soldier. And part of the law actually required that when soldiers were in battle, they abstain from relations with women. So Uriah was actually following the law, contrary to what his king had told him. And David actually knew that because there's another part in the scripture where he has talked about that when talking to a priest much earlier in his life. David was aware. He didn't care. Scholars also tend to think that, well, maybe Uriah suspected something. I mean, the, the king takes a sudden interest in you and tries so hard to get you to go to your house. You know, sends a gift after you to go to your house and, yeah. I'm a naturally suspicious person, so I might have been suspicious. He may or may not have been. We don't know. We don't know what was going through Uriah's head. But the point is, he maintained his integrity in the face of David's sin, whether or not he suspected it, which then, instead of causing David to repent, caused him to go the next step even further. And this is like the big red light with the big roadblock warning sign saying, do not enter, that he should have paid attention to. And that was when David handed Uriah this note commanding Joab to send him to the fiercest part of the battle and then pull back and let him die. He literally carried his own death warrant back to the front lines with him. That's harsh. You think there's any point in this when David should have said, okay, I really ought not do this. One would think, of course, one would have think Joab receiving that note should have been like, uh, no. But he didn't. And we're actually told that uh, when Uriah was killed, several others were killed as well. It, it wasn't just his death that David caused. It was several of his best fighting men. At any point in this process, he could have stopped. He could have said, no, I'm not going to ask about this woman. 
He could have said, no, I'm not going to send messengers to bring her to my house. He could have said, no, I'm not going to go in and sleep with her. He could have said, no, I'm not going to try to cover up my sin. I'm going to confess it. He could have said, I'm not going to have Uriah killed. I'm going to confess my sin and let God deal with it. But he didn't. How often do we fail to stop at stop signs? How often do we go, well, I can get away with this. How often do we think, well, this isn't a big sin. By the way, y'all know what the difference is between big sins and little sins? Whether it's ours or somebody else's. <laughs> yeah. That's how we see it. David thought he was entitled to all this. But he knew something was wrong. That's why he was trying so hard to keep it covered up. And we're going to see next week he did not keep it covered up. But that's uh, more for next week. But when we continue to ignore all the stop signs that God puts in front of us, and he always provides a way out of sin, but when we continue to ignore that and insist on doing what displeases him, then death is the only logical result. <laughs> Somebody was going to die over David's sin. Well, as it turns out, and we'll see more next week, you know, it was Uriah plus several other soldiers, plus the baby that Bathsheba conceived. Death is the natural, inevitable result of sin, of all sin, even if we see it as minor. Death is the result. When we fail to stop, when we fail to say, I shouldn't do that. When we fail to say, oh, I, I really missed the last warning. I need to pay attention to this one. If we keep going down that way, death is the result. However, when we heed God's warnings, when we obey the stop signs, when we turn away from our sin, whenever it is, God is merciful to forgive us. And we're going to see something, you know, next week in, you know, David being confronted with his sin. And one of the things I want you to think of, you know, I, I want to kind of want to give you a little bit to think of ahead of time, is just how immediate the forgiveness of sin is when you confess. It is instant. You don't have to work for forgiveness or any of that. You ask for it, and it's there. We are to heed God's warning and turn away from our sins and turn to him. And we are to encourage others to do the same. That means sharing the gospel with others. Of course, the gospel is good news, but before it's good news, it is bad news. And what's the bad news? That's right. We are all born as sinners separated from God. Every one of us. And every person alive can think of a sin they've committed. We are all born as sinners. What's the worst news? That's right. There is nothing we can do about it. Even if we can become perfect today, you know, I intend to be perfect this afternoon. I'm sure that will last until I fire up the grill. 
Yes, I'm making fajitas for Everett's birthday. <laughs> you see the point. We can't even stop sinning on our own. And even if we could, we can't make up for our past sins. But what's the good news? That's right. Jesus did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He was born of a virgin. He lived a life that was completely without sin, making him the perfect sacrifice to die on the cross for our sins. He died, was buried, rose again on the third day, proving that what he said was true and that his sacrifice was valid. And what's the best news of all? That's right. You must accept it. You can't earn it. Thank God. That'd be a high burden. But you must accept it. Let's encourage other people to do that this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and merciful Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture that we have dove into this morning. And we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to repent from our sins and turn to you. And we just ask that if there's anybody here today or watching online later who does not know Christ as their Savior, we would ask that this would be the day they would come to know him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.